Hi, welcome to MA342 Topology Lecture 18. And the first thing I should do is remind you that next Monday, Monday the 19th of April, we're going to have our second class test. So the second class test, ah, if I can, if the pen works, which it doesn't. So let me just, I have to redo this a sec. Um, to 18 fingers crossed don't know why it does that it kind of jams sometimes um, so yeah so uh, what did I say second class test uh, and a thin pen Second class test. Um, the Monday, the it's next Monday is what I mean. Monday, the 19th of April at 12 o'clock. So uh, the, it will cover material on the problem sheets, which was covered in lectures. before the Easter break. That was the So I can't remember up to what point on the problem sheet, but that's 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 what that's what we're covering. Um okay so I'm gonna talk more today about homotopy. Um but before I do that I'm gonna try to keep some of you on board because some of you might wonder why on earth are we, you know why are we studying all of this, especially if you're, uh, um, you know, financial maths and economics uh, student. You might wonder why you're having to study topology. Well, you're studying maths because it's 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 useful. But but to, to, to try to sell you topology, I just thought I would mention where we're going. So here is a paper. A, um, it's actually a th it's a it's a thesis or a project or whatever uh, thirty two pages it's not even thirty two pages it's um it's, it's about twenty seven pages so you're in the process of writing a paper I was saying between you know five pages to eight pages if there's three of you eight should be a maximum so it's on all of weeks one to eight. I don't know the number of weeks but it's the weeks up to uh, it's all of the weeks up to the break before. Easter. I can't remember what number week it was, but yeah, it's it's just to answer that question in the chat. The test is up to everything that we covered in the lectures before Easter. Somebody else can help me what weeks it was, but it it probably is. Uh, it's not this week anyway. Not you know, so not 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 this week. It's everything before this week. Are we in week nine this week? Can you answer that? Are we currently in week nine? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then it's on weeks one to eight. Then it's on weeks one to eight. Okay. This um. Uh, short paper. It's actually a PhD thesis. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Actually, if I if I make it bigger, how do I do this? If I make it a bit bigger, um, what do I do? Do do this? Huh. Okay. It's um. It's a, a dissertation. Uh, uh, the, the the it was written by a guy uh, John Nash. Uh, who who got his PhD for it? In fact, he he got more than a PhD. He got more or less a Nobel Prize for writing this short paper. Just to give you an idea of how long a pa how long does a paper have to be? Well, it doesn't have to be you know twenty seven pages, and you can get a PhD and a Nobel Prize. So the length of a paper is not really how you measure what's in a paper. Um, uh, written in um, nineteen sixty, isn't it? Um, and it was on. Uh, he introduced uh, some concepts in game theory. So I guess you've studied game theory in, or you either have or will study game theory in economics. Um, and so uh, John Nash uh, contributed a lot uh, to game theory early, was more or less founded it early in his career. Um, and in particular, he was interested in what are now called Nash equilibria. Uh, and he didn't call them Nash equilibria, he called them equilibria. Uh, and he proved the existence of equilibria point, whatever that means. And so later on in the course, I'm going to get on to talk briefly about uh, game theory. 
And why am I going to talk about game theory? Well, if we go down here, let me just speed things up. If I go to, I think it was page eight or nine, I can't remember. Let me just go down seven, let me see, eight, uh, nine. Okay, the existence of Nash equilibrium points uh, is what, what the thesis is all about. And he says in his thesis, I've previously published a proof of the result below about the theorem below every finite game has an equilibrium point so uh, you know in the, in the final lectures we'll, we'll, we'll give a meaning to, to, to what that, you know, that theorem says but I'm for the moment I'm more interested in the proof than the theorem um, so he, he given a, a, a proof of the result below based on uh, uh, I can't pronounce it uh, a generalized fixed point theorem but the proof that he gives in his thesis the proof below given here uses Brouwer's fixed point theorem Brouwer's theorem and so uh, Brouwer's theorem is a, a theorem that I'm going to cover in the in the in this module in the topology module so we're going to prove Brouwer's theorem and to prove Brouwer's theorem uh, we need to use homotopy. So this is how it all fits together. If you're doing a financial maths program wondering why you're doing this, well, maths is us useful generally. But in particular, in this instance, homotopy uh, is used to prove Brouwer's, and, and Euler characteristic is used to prove Brouwer's theorem, and Brouwer's theorem uh, is used very quickly. And I'll, I'll go ha I'll explain later on in the course how, how Brouwer's theorem uh, uh, pr proves theorem one, you know, um, uh, existence of Nash equilibria. Okay, so that's uh, enough of that. But I just thought I'd kind of let people know where we're going. Uh, and um, let me just remind you then what, about um, what I was doing yesterday. Yesterday I, I introduced the notion of homotopy so between maps. So what I said yesterday was two continuous functions, which I call maps, two maps, F and G, from a topological space X to a topological space Y, uh, are said to be homotopic, this is what I said yesterday, just repeating myself, um, if there exists a continuous function, a map, a, a map, I'll just say, a continuous function or a map, which I called capital H, from the product, direct product of x with the unit interval 0, 1 to y, sending a point, a pair x, comma t to some element in y, which uh, yesterday I was writing h t of x, um, such that when we restrict to t equal to 0, we get um, that h0 of x is just f of x, and when we restrict it t equal to 1, we get h1 of x is the same as the function uh, g of x. So that was um, what I did yesterday, and I, I tried to kind of explain it as best I can. So given two continuous functions between topological spaces, we can say that they're homotopic or not. But what I want to do today is talk about the notion of two spaces, two topological spaces being homotopy equivalent. Okay, so rather than talking about maps being homotopic, I, today I want to talk about two spaces being homotopy equivalent, and I want to write down that definition. So I'm just going to plonk down the definition. Um, there's no better way than that. I'm going to just write down the definition of what I want to talk about today. So is the definition for today. Two topological spaces, X and Y, are said to be homotopy equivalent that's the term I'm explaining or defining are said to be homotopy equivalent um, if there exists Two continuous functions, two maps, uh, which I'll call f from x to y, and I'll call my other map g. But now uh, I'm going to change things a bit. g, I'm going to 
is going to be a map from y to x. Yeah, so now f goes from x to y, but g is a map from y to x. Uh, and what do these maps have to satisfy? Well, they have to satisfy the following. If you compose f with g, so if you do g first, and then you do follow it by f, you go from y to x and back to y, you get a map. fg is a map from y to y. And whatever that map is, the requirement is that it has to be homotopy equivalent to the identity map on Y. The identity map sends you know, any point to itself. Um, and also, we require that if you compose G with F, then composing G with F, do F first, you go from X to Y, and then do G, you come back to X, you get a, a map from X to X, and that has to be homotopy equivalent to the identity map on X. Um, so, where let me just explain again what everything means. We're here. That means that homotopic yeah, so curly equals means FG is homotopic to the identity and GF is homotopic to the identity um, and let me just say then that 1 is the identity map. So 1x um, is the map going from x to x uh, is the identity function. So it sends a point little x to a point little x. It doesn't change anything. Uh, is the identity function on x. And I suppose on Y is the identity function on Y. So there you have the definition that I want to talk about um, today. Spaces being homotopy equivalent. Um, I think what I'll have to do, first of all, is give a, 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 an example of, of two spaces, which are homotopy equivalent, because that's a, you know, the, the mathematics now is getting more interesting, which means it's getting, it takes a bit longer to digest. Um, so, so to digest definitions and proofs even, it's good to, to, to work through examples. So let's, let's, let's look at an example. I'll go to a new page and I'll try to illustrate this definition. Um, Okay, so I can't remember what colour was that. That colour was uh, black. Let me go to blue. Example. I've called it... Ex uh, hang on. Far too fat. Hang on. Example one. Um, if X and Y are homeomorphic, If X and Y are two spaces, and if they are homeomorphic, um, then they are also homotopy equivalent. Yeah. So let me just explain why. Uh, so if you if, so so because we've come across homeomorphic spaces already in the course, so any two spaces which are homeomorphic, they're also homotopy equivalent. So uh, let's kind of explain why. What does it mean for two spaces to be homeomorphic? Let's just recall: if x and y are homeomorphic, then that means there exist maps, or I guess singular, is it? There exist maps, two maps, um, f from x to y and g from y to x with, and then the definition of homeomorphism is that F, 
g is actually equal to 1. And gf is equal to the identity on y. Now, I got that the wrong way around, didn't I? So, so fg is the identity on x. Sorry. Oh, sorry, is the identity. F, fg is the identity. No, I had it right, was it F? FG is the identity. No, FG is the identity on Y, and GF is the identity on X. Um, so, um, and so if there, so apologies, I should just, that was an equals I meant to say. Hang on. So if two, if two, you know, if, if if fg is equal to the identity, it's also homotopy equivalent to the identity. I suppose you could get that by um, the reflexive property. I won't write it down, but I mean, you know, rather than prove it, I mean, we saw yesterday that homotopy is of maps is is an equivalence relation. It's reflexive, so any map is homotopic to itself. So fg is homotopic to itself, but if fg is the same as one, it means that fg is homotopic to one. Yeah, so, so you know, by reflexivity. Having said, I won't write it down. I just wrote it down. So there's an example. Um, not, not the most exciting example. But now we know that any time we have two spaces which are homeomorphic, they're actually homotopy equivalent. Uh, but in fact, you can get spaces which are homotopy, homotopy equivalent, which are not homeomorphic. So let's have a, a second example to illustrate that. So example two. Be a bit more involved, maybe. Um, let's consider the space X consisting of all of the complex numbers, the complex plane, except for the complex number zero, the, the, the number zero. Yeah, so think of the plane of all complex numbers excluding zero. And let y be the circle. And by a circle, I guess I mean all complex numbers whose modulus is one. So let y be the collection of all complex numbers, all z in the complex plane, such that the size of z, the modulus of z, is equal to one. So it's a circle. Uh, and these two spaces are quite different. They're not homeomorphic. Uh, one is just a, you know, a, a circle, a one-dimensional circle. The other, the x, is a whole two-dimensional plane minus a, a pinprick in the middle. You've just taken one point out. But they're actually homotopy equivalent. And so um, let's just see that. So the spaces x, well, these spaces x, y are homotopy equivalent. So we have to do some uh, reasoning here since, well, um, we have, so if I want to prove that, um, that they're homotopy equivalent, I have to construct a function g from x to y, a function f, for, no, a function f from x to y, a function g from y to x, such that f, g, and g, f are homotopic to the identity. So I need to, first of all, construct the functions. So let's consider the functions. Um, I could take, let's do the, let's do g from y to x. That's the easier one, I suppose. Well, y here is a circle. Yeah, it's the circle. All the complex numbers of size 1. Um, well, any complex number of size 1 is, a no, x, x is the space of non-zero complex numbers. Well, any complex number of size 1 is a non-zero uh, complex number. So we can just send a number z to z yep that's that's an inclusion any any number z on the circle is also a number z in in the 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 the, the, the set of non-zero complex numbers so g is just the ide is this the function it's not the identity it's the function which includes the circle into into the non-zero complex numbers uh and let's have a look at what, what could we take for f to think a little bit more about this we need a function going from the the, the, the non-zero complex numbers to the circle 
the, the complex numbers of size 1 and what we can do there is we can take any out non-zero complex number and we can send it to uh, 1 divided by the size of that the modulus of that complex number the complex number is non-zero so this won't be zero on the bottom times the complex number and there we have a function f uh, which takes any non-zero complex number and sends it to a complex number of size 1 on the circle so we've got two functions f and g um, so now what do I have to do I have to check let's just go back to the definition wherever it was uh, I have to check that those two functions do the trick I have to check that fg is homotopy equivalent to the identity and that gf is homotopy equivalent to the identity so let's have a look at both of those um, ah, hang on. I should learn to master this uh, going up and down on the, the white page better so let, let me go back to blue uh, my notes say something you should never write down clearly uh, usually when I say clearly it's probably not even true but it, I think it is clear okay let's, let's just check it is clear if I take the, the composite function fg and I apply it to z let's see can I ask a question in the chat what do I get if I apply suppose g is in y uh, suppose z is in y so suppose z is a function on the circle and I apply the function g to it and then I apply the function f to what I get what do I end up with what's fg of z any any offers while I sip my coffee z yeah I'll go along with that it's just z so that's that's so it is clear well it was clear to you anyway because you told me um uh and so in other words fg the map fg is just the identity map Yep, it is the identity map, and so by reflexivity, it's 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 if it is the identity map, then it's certainly homotopic to the identity map. Yep. Um, let's have a look at GF. Let me do it the right way around. GF of Z. Now I take Z to be any point in X. Z is any non-zero complex number. Who can tell me in the chat? What do I get when I when I work out GF of Z just to wake people up rather than he, listening to me talking nonstop? What what's what is that clearly? GF is any answers? Is it Z again? Yeah, yeah, it's just Z. It's just Z. It's just Z again. Ah, oh, well, well, it's it's it is Z again. It it's. Hang on, uh, well, no, hang on, hang on. Um, no, no, hang on, no, no, I mean, no, no X is a, no, it's not Z, it's, uh, Z is any number, in, in any non-zero complex number. It's, it's, yeah, yeah I, I know what you mean, it's not 1 over Z, but it's, I, I, you, you, you're you writing this, it's 1 over the size of Z, yeah, that that's a scalar, that's a real number, it's that times Z. That's what that is. And what I'm claiming, I mean, so this one is definitely uh, a homotopy equivalent. And I claim that, um, I better explain this, that GF is actually homotopy equivalent to the identity on X. But I better, I better prove that. So to see that GF, is homotopy equivalent to the identity function on x we'd better do some um, uh, reasoning we'd better i mean in the first case there's nothing to in the, if fg equals the identity it's certainly homotopy homotopic to the identity here uh gf isn't equal to the identity it's equal to it's so i need a homotopy i need to come up with a homotopy so the best thing i can do is look at my notes rather than uh draw it out too long so to see that um we, we can use the following homotopy. Now I'm going to write down a homotopy between GF and the identity. So a homotopy, what is it? It's a function, it's a continuous map, it's a, it's a map, it's a continuous function. From X, direct product, the unit interval, to X. Yep, that's what we want, because we want a homotopy between GF 
which is a map from X to X, and the identity on X. So this is what my homotopy should uh, look like, and I have to give a formula for it. So if I take a point Z in X, a non-zero complex number Z, and a point T in the unit interval, so a number T between 0 and 1, um, I'd better tell you what it goes to. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write down, uh, I'm going to write down rather than work it out, I'm going to write down what I know it goes to. It goes to 1 minus T divided by the size of Z plus T. So what I've written in those brackets is just, that's just a real number, isn't it? It's 1 minus t, whatever t is, it's a real number, divided by the size of the modulus of z, that's just a real number, and it's non-zero, because z is a non-zero com complex number, plus a real number, so that's just a real number, it's a scalar, times z. And then, uh, so we use that homotopy, I claim it's a continuous map, because if you change z just a little bit, and change t just a little bit, then the output changes just a little bit. I have no idea how you got that. No, I worked hard to get it. I'll tell you exactly how I got it. I probably spent 10 minutes working at, oh God, what's the homotopy? And I came up with it. And now what I have to convince you is not how I came up with it, but I have to convince you that what I came up with is the correct, you know, will do the trick. Yeah, Does that, is that okay? So, so, you know, where did, I'm not Einstein, but where did Einstein get his idea? I don't know where Einstein got his ideas from, but are they sound? Well, we can check are they sound. So, I, you know, Somehow, this formula, I have it scribbled in my notes down here, so I hope it does the trick. Does it really do the trick? So we use this homotopy, and we note uh, that, well, does it do the trick? Let's have a look. If I take t to be 0, if t is 0, what do I get? z0 is, it's the number 1 minus 0 over the size of z, so 1 minus 0 over the size of z is just 1 over the size of z plus 0. That's just 1 over the size of z. Uh, 1 over the size of z times z. Um, 1 over the size of z times z, that is exactly uh, gf. Yeah. Now what do I get when I take t equal to 1? When I take t equal to 1, uh, I get z... 1 goes to 1 minus 1, that's easy, that's 0, plus 1, that's 1 times z, oh, it just goes to z, yep, uh, which is the, um, should I, I shouldn't say the, you know, it's, it's gf of z is what I meant here, and so here, what is this, this is just the identity uh, on um, uh, x of z, so we're done. That homotopy does the trick. It's a homotopy between GF and the identity. So we have everything we need. And there's an example then of two spaces, the circle and the non-zero complex numbers, two different spaces. They're not homeomorphic, but they are homotopy equivalent. Any questions on that? Gives me a chance to sip my coffee. Then... I'm going to write down now, and this is the this is the one big cheat in the course. I'm going to cheat. I'm not going to prove this. This is the bit where I, you know, rather than give you all the gory details of everything up to um, John Nash's Nobel Prize winning, you know, existence of equilibria, I'm going to give you everything except the proof of the following result. That's where I cheat. Well, I'm not a cheat. It's just I'm speeding things up. So I'm going to write down the major theorem. If there's one theorem, if in 20 years' time you one day think back, oh, God, what did I do in college? Oh, there was that Egypt Ellis who talked about topology. Oh, I remember his major theorem. So if this is the only thing that you take away 20 years hence, thinking back uh, from this course, I'd be delighted, okay? The major theorem is this. Um, black. Major theorem... is this. Let x, y be spaces with triangulations. Now, okay, it's a major theorem, so even the statement is quite sophisticated. So, if in 20 years' time you know what all these words mean, I'd be really delighted, okay? So, so uh, let x, y be, be spaces with triangulations.
Yeah, so there's a simplicial complex K, which is homeomorphic to X, and there's a simplicial complex K prime, which is homo homeomorphic to Y. Now here's the, 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 the theorem then. If X and Y are homotopy equivalent, if X and Y are homotopy equivalent, Yeah. So, for example, they could just be homeomorphic because any homeomorphic spaces are homotopy equivalent. So that we've got that example. So if you just want to make it easy for yourself, if X and Y are homeomorphic, but it's a much stronger result because the circle is homotopy equivalent to the non-zero complex numbers and they're no way homeomorphic. So uh, this is a stronger result I'm writing. If X, Y are homotopy equivalent, then the Euler characteristic of X, yeah, chi, that's supposed to be a chi. The Euler characteristic of X equals the Euler characteristic of Y. And that, folks, is how people proved that homeomorphic spaces have the same Euler characteristic. They proved a stronger result. It was easier to prove, actually, the stronger result that homotopy equivalent spaces have the same Euler characteristic. And then you get for free that homeomorphic ones uh, are. So let me just put a box around that because that's the major theorem. And I, I'm not going to prove it. I mean, the proof isn't so involved that it couldn't be given to you. It just would take too many lectures. So uh, we're going to just assume this. But I think what we do, I mean, the first time you meet a, a theorem, you have to play with it and look at some examples to get a feel for what does the theorem say. Whenever you, you know, before you try to prove or try to read a proof of any theorem, the first thing you do is you take the theorem, you read it, you try to work through some examples. What is that theorem really saying? You maybe go for a long walk, think what the theorem's saying, and then come back and say, okay, now that I know what the theorem's saying, let me try to see what the, how the proof goes. But we will skip the proof in this case. So let me do some um, illustrations of this, this theorem. Let me just see how I'm... Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay for time. Illustration. Yeah, very fat pen. Hang on, a thin pen. Illustration. Um, let me consider two homotopy equivalent spaces. Well, here's, here's one space. The cylinder... Um, what do I mean by a cylinder? What I mean by a cylinder is the space got by taking a circle, I mean black is what I want, I, I take a circle, which I write as S1, a circle, everybody knows what a circle is. If I take the direct product of the circle with the unit interval, I get, well, maybe I should call it a pipe rather than a cylinder, I get a, a pipe with no ends. You know, I get the circle you know the circle direct product the interval is is a is a is a pipe of length one you can you know with a hole right the way through it so i'm going to call that the cylinder the cylinder uh let me give another space is actually homotopy equivalent to a circle Now, I'm not going to prove that because it was just, I don't want to prove everything, but it's, it's not difficult. I mean, how did we show that the complex plane is homotopy equivalent to a circle? Well, kind of what I did, I said, look, you can just slide all of the points in the plane either up or down so that they hit on a ray and they hit the circle. So you can, you can slide, you can deform the complex, the, the non-zero numbers in the complex plane, you can deform them so that they all, just by multiplying by their size, so that they all sl slide onto the circle. So the circle is homo homotopic, homotopy equivalent to the non-zero complex numbers. Well, we can do the same thing here. If we take the cylinder, I can slide, this is the proof. Why is the cylinder uh, homotopy equivalent to the circle? Well, here, here's the proof. I take my cylinder and I just slide it bit by bit by bit. Every point gets pushed along until I'm there at the circle. So there's a homotopy equivalence between the cylinder and the circle. Yeah, can, you can write down the details if you want. Um, 
Well, let's just accept it. So what the main major theorem says is that they should have the same Euler characteristic. So let's just check that. Let's just check that the cylinder and the circle really do have the same Euler characteristic. So let me have a look at the cylinder first of all. The cylinder, if I want to work at the Euler characteristic of the cylinder, I'd better ask myself what on earth is the cylinder, so I'll draw a picture of it. A pretty useless picture really, this is my picture of the cylinder. A hollow pipe. And a better picture is to say, how would I really get the cylinder? And I'd get the cylinder out of a piece of paper by identifying opposite edges and I'd have my, my cylinder. So let's do that. Let me, so in other words, I can get the cylinder by taking a piece of paper, well, a, a unit interval even, make it a bit more mathematical, take a unit interval and identify the opposite points on the opposite edges okay so uh, let me number some points I'll do it in a different color so here's a point let me call that point one that point one is the same as that point one yeah because I've identified the two edges uh, and maybe up here I've got you know maybe I'll call this point two well that point two is the same as this point here so that's also two um, and let me add in a few more points that's, let me call that three, let me call that four. Uh, let me add in some edges. And lo and behold, I hope I have a triangulation of the cylinder. I have a simplicial complex drawn in black and red, which is homeomorphic to the cylinder. So that's, that's you know, we did some examples like that. So let's work out then the Euler characteristic. So the Euler characteristic of the cylinder is the number of vertices so wakey wakey how many vertices are there in my triangulation I can wake everybody up in the chat how many vertices in the triangulation four minus the number of edges how many edges are there in the triangulation red and black how many edges Oh, people are having to think. Uh, I I go along with eight. It's it's it, it's eight, isn't it? I think it's eight. It's what um one two on the bottom, three four on the top, five is you know this edge is the same as that five, and then red edges six seven eight. Yeah, so I, I reckon it's eight. Plus the number of two simplices. So how many two simplices? This is a solid piece of paper. So how many you know triangles? How many two simplices do do I have? How many triangles? Four. Four. So we get zero. So the Euler characteristic of a, of a, of a, of a, um, um, uh, a cylinder is zero. Let me now have a look at the Euler characteristic of a circle. I'd better get zero, but let me just do it properly. So let me take a circle. Uh, do I change? I'll change color. If I, if I change color, if I take a circle. So a circle is easier to draw than a cylinder. There's my circle. Now I need a triangulation of the circle, so I need vertices and edges. I, you know, I, a triangle is, you know, will do a, a, a hollow. So I take some vertices, three vertices and three edges. Yeah, so that's what I've got. That's my triangulation there of the of the circle. Yeah, it's homeomorphic to a the kind of triangle you get in primary school. The, you know, when you play, you, you know, the the triangle that you the musical instrument triangle um, yep yeah. so and then what's the Euler characteristic of the circle that's the triangulation so the Euler characteristic of the circle blue is it better be zero but let's work it out it's three vertices there are three edges and there's nothing else there are no two simplices because it's it's one dimensional so you get zero yep same answer so that just illustrates what this theorem is saying, but the theorem is very general. It's for any two spaces which are um, triangulated and homotopy equivalent. Now, I have uh, nine minutes and I want to 
do another important illustration. That was just a fun illustration. Let me do another important illustrate two of them, which are which will stretch your brains a bit more than on, than that. So, a um, uh, next illustration of the major theorem. Um, the M N simplex. Let me take the N simplex. The N simplex. It's the convex hull of n plus 1. Um, just to confirm, that is a ring, not a solid disk. Yeah, yeah, just to confirm. When I see, yeah, yeah, it, it, that's a good question. It's a ring. It's a, it's a, it's a ring. It's, uh, so mathematicians, they, they, they say S1 is a circle. By a circle, they mean a ring. And if ever, I'm not going to write it down, but if ever they write S2, uh, that's a two-dimensional circle. That's a sphere. A football, a hollow football, and there's an S3 and an S4 and so on. So yeah, that's definitely a ring, um, uh, not not you know it's an empty ring. So what are we trying to do? Um, so the n simplex, uh, let me call it delta n. So that's the convex hull of n plus one points generically positioned uh, in space. If the, so the, the 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 two simplex is a solid triangle. The three simplex is a solid tetrahedron. The one simplex is a solid edge. And in general, you've got the n simplex. Uh, is homotopy equivalent to the space, which I'm going to write square bracket star, the space consisting of just a single point. The one point space, the topological space with just one point in it. So let's think about it for n equal to 3. T -t -take, take the 3 simplex. The 3 simplex is a solid tetrahedron. How on earth is the solid tetrahedron homotopy equivalent to a point? Well, really, I'd have to write down a homotopy, but I'm going to do it in my kind of the way that topologists do. I somehow have to continuously deform the, the, the tetrahedron into a point. So I just squeeze it, or I shrink it, or I multiply by a factor. I shrink it all down, and somehow it all continuously closes up to a point. That's not a, you know, that, that's, that's speeding things up. But I mean, you could write down the maths of that, but, but uh, it's contractible. Because it's, we've seen that, haven't we? I, uh, did I? No, that was a different course. Okay, I'm okay, getting confused with what I said in this course. So, so but it, it's, uh, it, it's, 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 um, it consists of a, of a single point. So, maybe you didn't like that proof, in which case you can look at the book, I am sure, because I think there are things on it there. But let's just assume, accept that. And then let me ask you, so who can tell me what is the Euler characteristic of an N simplex? If you don't like N, take a 3 simplex. What's the Euler characteristic? No, don't take 3. Take N equal to 4. What's the Euler characteristic of a 4 simplex? But do remember that I'm trying to talk about the major theorem, which says that if two spaces are homotopy equivalent, they have the same Euler characteristic. That's what I'm trying to get across. If two spaces are homotopy equivalent, and I'm telling you that the 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 um, the n simplex is homotopy equivalent to a point, so what's the Euler characteristic of the of the, of the n simplex? No answers. Hmm. Let me say. Ah, close, 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 close. It's the Euler characteristic of a single a space with a single point. So I give a space with a single point a triangulation involving a point. So how many vertices are there? How many vertices are there? I have a single point, one, minus the number of edges. There's no edges, minus the, So it's just one. Yep. That's an, that's an illustration. Uh, if I want to number these illustrations, so that I... This is illustration zero. I'm not really interested in illustration zero. Uh, illustration one 
uh, will be of relevance to economics, so I'd better call it one. And illustration two is even more relevant to economics. Um, let me work out the Euler characteristic of an n-sphere. Now, okay, I'm blowing people's brains, maybe, but for an n-sphere, just take n to be 2. So I've got a 2-sphere. Right? Take n to be 2. I've got a 2-sphere, a football. A football is homeomorphic to, I can deform it to the surface of a tetrahedron. Yeah? Or, or, you know, a hollow te So a, a football is homeomorphic to a hollow tetrahedron. A hollow tetrahedron is almost... So let me write down something which is wrong. This is wrong what I'm going to write down now. A hollow tetrahedron is almost like the boundary of a... Of a you know, so if, if, if n is 2, then my tetrahedron would be, you know, a solid three-dimensional tetrahedron. That's wrong. Because this is solid. This has an inside. But when you look at the triangulation of a tetrahedron, you've got all the vertices and all the edges and all the faces. And basically, the surface of the tetrahedron is homeomorphic to the sphere. The only difference is you have one extra face. The whole n, n plus 1 dimensional face. There's, you're out by a factor of 1. So up to plus or minus 1, yep. We get we get that. Well, um, the Euler characteristic of a tetrahedron of a, of a simplex is one, so we get one plus or minus one. So the answer is either one or it is either two or zero. Yeah, it actually depends on whether. Explain that bit again, please. Ah, yeah. Okay, which bit? Um, the, the last bit, the the sphere, okay, take n equal to 2. The 2-sphere is homeomorphic to the surface of a three-dimensional tetrahedron, a solid tetrahedron. So the Euler, and, and if it's homeomorphic, it's, it's homotopy equivalent. So by the major theorem, the Euler characteristic of the 2-sphere is the same as the Euler characteristic of the solid three-dimensional tetrahedron. Well, I've forgotten the three-dimensional face, so I better it's plus or minus one. You know, I'm you know, that's the bit that I explained. So, but this bit, the Euler characteristic of the tetrahedron is one. So my answer is one plus or minus one. So the answer is either two or zero. Um, and in fact, I, I go to another page. In fact. Um, the Euler characteristic, you can, you can make all of that a bit more precise. Um, what's the Euler characteristic of a, of, a, um, of a circle? Take n equal to 1. We've just worked it out. The Euler characteristic of a circle, a one-dimensional um, you know, a ring, we've just worked it out to be 0. What's the Euler characteristic of a S2, n equal to 2? The Euler characteristic of a sphere, that's the surface of Mars. We all know that it's 2. And then you can go on the Euler characteristic of S3, you know, the, the, the boundary of a 4 sim, simplex is, is 0. And it go, it, so the answer is, when you work it out, it's equal to either 0 or 2. But let me do it more uh, accurately. It's equal to 0 when n is odd. And it's equal to 2 when n is even. Yeah? So we can get Euler characteristics. Um, and then 1, 1, 1, 1... Uh, second over one minute over. Okay, I got. I'm I'm on time now, fifty. But let me just write down one more thing. I want to um, to say this. Why am I talking about the above major theorem? Well, we'll just assume it, and then we'll use the above major theorem without proving it. Um, to prove the following neat result, which is called Brouwer's Theorem. And we saw reference to Brouwer's Theorem in John Nash's um, PhD thesis, which is available online. I'll, I'll put a link to it in the, on, the, 
from the course web page. Uh, Brouwer's theorem. So, uh, what does Brouwer's theorem say? Well, the way I'm going to state, I mean, there are different ways of writing it down. I'm going to write it down like this. Let delta n be the n-simplex. Yeah, so if n is equal to 3, it's a solid tetrahedron. Then Brouwer's theorem says that any continuous function, any continuous function or any map, any continuous function, uh, which I'll call f, from the n simplex to the n simplex, doesn't matter how you define f, it will have a fixed point. Which begs the question, which raises, raises the question, what on earth is a fixed point? What I mean is, um, i.e., uh, yeah, I do have enough space. I, what do I mean by a fixed point? A point x in the uh, n simplex such that f of x is equal to x. Now, that's Brouwer's theorem, and for any, I'll, I'll talk more about it next time, for n equal to 1, you can prove it using first year maths, and I'll do that, just the intermediate value theorem. For n equal to 2, I bet you won't be able to prove it. If you want to, you know, if you're bored and you want something to do, try proving it for n equal to 1, that's, that's just first year. Yep, that's just first year. Try it for n equal to 2, I bet you can't do it without looking at a book. I bet you can't prove it for n equal to 2, and, uh, and we'll need it uh, for arbitrary n. So, uh, but how do we prove it? Well, well, there are various proofs, but the proof we're going to use is, follows kind of the classical approach to it, uh, uses the, the major theorem about the Euler characteristic of homotopy equivalent uh, spaces being, being equal. So that's where I stop, folks. Um, sorry for going over three minutes. But Brouwer's theorem we need because we want to talk about uh, uh, Rash equilibria for the financial mathematicians in the class. Okay, four minutes over. Um, any questions before I stop recording? Or let me stop recording and then I'll ask again. Any? Hang on.